Hi, this one's going to be a bit of an unusual one. I came across this CMI home safe here, made in Australia, you bloody beauty. And it's got one of these uh, Lagarde digital locks on it. And I thought, hmm, I wonder if there's any way that we can sort of, you know, have a look to see if we can hack into this lock and actually open the thing rather than, you know, like trying to like physically crack into the safe. I wonder how easy these things are, if there's any vulnerabilities in these locks. So I thought we'd do a video just seeing if we can do what's called a power line uh, analysis, power line attack on one of these things. And you'll see what I'm talking about in a few minutes. Now this is a CMI branded safe. They make uh, really top quality uh, safes here in Australia, here in uh, Sydney, I believe actually. And this is the uh, one of their home, you know, one of their basic home models. And it's the H2D. I'll link in the data, data sheet down below. And it's a pretty, you know, entry level home safe. It's probably the absolute minimum you'd want to actually uh, protect anything as opposed to those pieces of shit that you get at Bunnings, uh, that just like at the home, you know, Home Depot or where, where, whatever country you're in, those, you know, $50, $100, couple of hundred dollar safes. This is like a, you know, a seven, $800 a safe. It's about the minimum you can get. And if we have a look inside this thing, we'll see that it's got a 12 millimeter thick uh, front steel plate. Yeah. That's not too bad. It's got a uh, deadbolt on the thing. Looks like maybe it has an anti-drill uh, plate there. I'm not entirely sure. I don't think it's like a proper manganese steel or some other type of uh, anti-drill plate uh, steel, but it's not too bad at all. It's got some reinforcement around the uh, front here and it's got mounting holes down the bottom and at the back as well and six millimeter uh, steel all around. So it's, it's just a basic um, safe that would probably protect you against just the casual opportunistic thief with their crowbar. They probably couldn't get into this in a hurry, but of course any uh, professional uh, thief would just, you know, rip through this with uh, power tools and things like that. No problems. But if you, you, you securely mount this to the uh, back wall and the uh, floor to uh, con concrete, for example, eh, it's going to stop your basic uh, thief. So it's pretty much the minimum that you'd want for a home uh, safe. But I thought, yeah, is there any vulnerabilities in these electronic locks? Hmm. Now this is actually a LG brand, not to be confused with LG, the el electronic company. This is uh, Lagarde, and these are pretty much the industry standard basic electronic lock. Uh, Lagarde are one of less than a handful of top companies in the world who make these electronic locks. You know, there's other brands like uh, s and Sargent and Greenleaf, uh, for example, are some of the world leaders in this thing. And I believe this is the uh, 3750 model. It's their basic model. So this is used on safe up to you know a couple of thousand dollars worth this uh cmi home model by the way has a uh, recommended cash rating insurance cash rating of uh, five thousand dollars so it's not you know it's not a, a real super duper safe but as i said probably good enough really if you're interested in what are actually good saves you know, you really if you want a real proper one, you need one what's called a TDR safe. They're called different things in different countries, but that's what they're called here. And TDR stands for torch and drill resistant. So as I said, it's got uh, like any manganese drill plates. It's got a glass relocker in there. So it has a glass plate. So if you try and drill through uh, to access the uh, solenoid mechanism and stuff like that, it shatters the glass plate and lockers come in place and things like that. This one, as I, as I showed, only has the one deadbolt here. Others have, you know, multiple deadbolts and they'll have, uh, you know, anti-cutting, anti-grinding in materials built into the uh, steel walls and, you know, things like that. So, yeah, pretty much, you know, if you want a real, real safe, in quote marks, you need a uh, TDR uh, class safe. So to open one of these, it's a six digit combination. It must be uh, six digits. You can program it to be any six di digits. This one happens to have, um, I believe, like the original factory code. So it's just one, two, three, four, five. If we actually do it incorrect, you'll see that it beeped at, at us, flashed the lead, and if this is actually the handle to turn the thing. Some actually have a separate handle to uh, turn the, um, the bolts in the thing, but this one like that. So if we go one, two, three, four, five, six, bingo, you might have heard the solenoid click in place, and we're in like Flynn. Yeah. 
Now, there's a few attack methods for these uh, electronic locks. Uh, one which I'll just mention because, well, everyone else will want me to mention it, is to use a thermal imaging camera. And if somebody has just operated the lock, like, you know, seconds or minutes maybe uh, before, then it'll show up as a thermal signature. So if I go in there and touch those like that, you can see that my thermal signature is showing up there on the buttons and you can actually determine the order they were pressed in based on how quickly they fade out. But you can see that's faded out pretty quickly. So that's not really a valid attack. And by the way, if you uh, do that, you can just go like that afterwards, you know, and nobody's going to be able to see a thing. And this is how people can steal your um, pin numbers at uh, checkouts and things like that. They can just have one of those phone uh, thermal imaging uh, cameras and they can steal your pin number if you're that paranoid. The second method is what's called the bump method, where you actually just pick up the safe and drop it down on the floor. I kid you not, or just bang it on the top like that. Now, this is a, a valid method for like those real cheap ass safes that you buy at the hardware store that I mentioned. You know, those $50, $100, you know, real basic safes or the ones that you get in hotel rooms and things like that. They're susceptible to this bump method. So you can just like bang on the top of these cheap safes and you can open it. But hey, no, this is actually at least a you know, a decent basic safe. This one is not susceptible to any sort of bump method. It basically means just the, the spring-loaded um, uh, solenoid inside. Just by bumping it, you can actually operate the solenoid. You don't actually have to defeat it electronically. So anyway, I might do a video. I might get one of those cheap $50 safes and bunnings and actually demonstrate that. But yeah, th those things are useless. Just do not buy hardware store safes. They're ridiculous. Now the third method, which was actually quite a valid method and might still be on some really old saves, I'm talking like, you know, 20 years old, early 90s when I believe Lagarde were the first to introduce a commercial digital uh, lock. Anyway, the early digital locks were apparently susceptible to what's known in the industry as uh, spiking. And what that means is you can actually remove this uh, front and you could actually get access inside this front electronic lock mechanism to the pins which go to the solenoid and of course if you got that you can just come along with your you know like a battery and you could like spike what's called spike the pins and operate the solenoid and bingo open the thing but no they pretty much fixed that you know a long long time ago um, so I don't believe there's a single electronic lock at least not a quality one on the market these days that would be susceptible to uh, that sort of spiking. And of course the uh, fourth method would of course be to like you know drill through and things like that but you know they're, they're, they're like physical attacks I don't I you know I'm not interested in that sort of thing but what I am interested in is ta-da the 9 volt battery that comes down. These are our wire. These are the only wires that we have available and I'm wondering can we subject this thing to a power line analysis attack, i.e. be able to uh, uh, tap into here, measure the uh, current going through, and see if we can actually detect any process, any changes on the power line, any spikes on the power line, based on the internal processor when it changes, when you enter either a correct digit or an incorrect digit, for example. So I'm thinking that maybe... Like, you know, if you enter, if you press the correct digit, it goes into one subroutine. If you press an incorrect digit, it goes into another subroutine. And that could manifest itself as different variations in timing on current pulses taken from here. And, well, this is all, I don't know if it's valid, if, if we're going to be able to measure anything at all. It depends on how much decoupling they've actually designed into this thing and stuff like that. But because it's available, I thought we'd give it a go. Now, before we do that, let's just take a look at the uh, deadbolt lock mechanism. This one actually comes in two types, a deadbolt uh, like this or a swing bolt uh, mechanism. So let's just take this plate off and see what sort of uh, wiring we've got coming through from the front. Now, if you see inside that battery uh, holder there, there's really nothing else inside there apart from the wires going up into the... Uh, mechanism and through the hole in the uh, front door. 
Here's the deadbolt lock itself. It's got all the requisite uh, standards. It's UL listed, it's VDS, it's EN 1300 uh, rated, and all that sort of jazz. So, you know, it really is a proper electronic lock. And they've actually conveniently tied up. Can I get that out? Oh, there we go. I just pushed that in. That's nice. And that connector comes out, we've got ourselves a four pin connector, that's not surprising at all, so the solenoid, the circuit for the solenoid is inside this, so it does not penetrate to the outside, so that's why I said you can't actually spike these things and operate the solenoid from the outside, it's pretty much impossible. Um, so, uh, but all we've got is the power of course, these four pins, you'd have the uh, nine volt battery power and the two data pins coming from the uh, keypad, that's it. So, you know, pretty much you can't attack this thing in any other way apart from the power line analysis attack, that's, that's pretty much the only thing you could do. Now we might see if we can open up this thing later and have a uh, squiz if it's easy enough. It looks like that top plate there might actually uh, come off. But for now, let's try the power line analysis attack. Now I do actually have a dedicated tool for this job. This is the uh, Chip Whisperer Lite, which was a Kickstarter and was in the uh, Hackaday Prize. And you've uh, seen this a little bit before. And this is designed for power line analysis attack exactly like this. But not everyone's got one of these or, you know, can take this out in the field to crack locks like this. So I thought that we'd just try it with the basic, uh, the most basic tool available, a a resistor for power line current sensing and an oscilloscope. Let's see what we can get from that first. Well, this is embarrassing. I got my 10 ohm resistor. I was going to whack in series with the battery here. Hook my scope up and, um, yeah. Hang on. It no longer beeps at all. Can you guess what I've done? Oh. Oh. Well, in case you haven't figured it out yet, no, I cannot get back into this safe. I have locked myself out. Oh. How? Well, a lot of people were probably screaming at me. I forgot to reconnect the cable back in there that goes from the keypad to the solenoid. And I was like playing around with it. And I thought, well, I thought I'd plugged it back in, relock the thing in the closed position. And no, because I was, you know, I was going to go, yeah, I want to do the shot where I, you know, open the, you know, I do the power line attack and try and open it, blah, blah, blah. And no. The solenoid is disconnected inside the keypad, the battery. There's nothing I can do. I have to crack into the, to fix this, I have to crack into this safe the old fashioned way so that I can reach through and reconnect the bloody connector. Oh, yeah. Welcome to the EV vlog. Yes, I'm back in the old lab, the garage here, and I bought it here to see if we can drill through the sucker and try and fix it. Oh, let's go. Considering that we've already got the holes in the bottom and we've also got holes in the back as well. These are the uh, mounting holes. You can mount it to the wall and or floor. Why not um, drill a couple more holes in the bottom? Um, that shouldn't actually affect the um, safe at all, really. In fact, it provides a couple of more convenient bolt down points. We've got uh, six mil steel. I'm not sure if it's like hardened steel or mild steel or whatever it is. But uh, yeah, we'll give it a go. It shouldn't be that hard. Now, unfortunately, I've actually loaned out my power drill, so I'm going to have to use my cordless drill. <laughs> And I'm through, but of course I need a much bigger hole than this to manipulate it. But I want to have a look and uh, shine a torch in there. And I can see the pesky plug. 
So I want to be a bit above it, it's down like here or something like that. And of course I could use like the angle grinder and I'd probably cut through this thing pretty quick. And you know, if you're a pro uh, thief and you didn't care about noise, and you know, this is what you'd be using to crack into um, you know, a safe, unless it's uh, a TDR safe, as I mentioned, torch and drill resistant, and then it just blunt these like, you know, and blunt uh, drill bits, uh, and just getting a couple of millimeters into the thing. So, uh, let alone through all the material, because uh, this, this safe is only just uh, six millimeters still. Like you can get like 12 millimeter plated ones, for example, but your good ones actually have steel plate outside. Then they have inner material, which actually contains all sorts of particles, which actually blunt all your drill bits and uh, blunt all your uh, grinding bits and things like that. And then they have another inner steel plate. So that's what the uh, TDR um, safes have got. Now, the thing with this, of course, is that you've got to go real slow because if you accidentally push through, you could easily cut the cable inside, so definitely don't want to do that. I drilled another one, which is basically bang on to what I want. And even with these um, clamp scissor forcep things, it's just short. I can't reach it. Bloody Murphy every time. The second hole is really handy for being able to actually see through and see what you're actually uh, doing while shining a torch through the hole in the back here to light it all up. But uh, I think I might ultimately, um, you know, you could use like a, uh, a bore scope, one of these uh, little, you know, microscope. This is actually a microscope like this, but it can set infinity uh, distance focal distance on it and it's got a little light on the front and it can work as a webcam so I can hook that up to the uh, PC it's a USB thing and have my notebook next to it and I can actually use that as a bore scope to see inside exactly what I'm doing and you can see the cable just flapping around in the breeze there dull and uh, you could use a view like this to manipulate it as you come in from the side well from the uh, bottom bottom holes there we go you can see the hole drilled in the bottom there and uh, the two holes, but I can uh, put this cam in the top hole. Let's have a look at that. Well, I knew I was going to try and break into a safe, but I didn't think I'd have to do it this way. Jeez, uh, the, I haven't got long enough uh, scissor clamp forcepy things. I'm going to try and get in there, maybe with some metal skewers and get the thing. Anyway, I've got my camera set up here with some blue tack. I've got a little screen to look at and manipulate, but geez, it's not going to be easy. And it's important to get the tongue at the right angle. So let's see if we can actually get in here and use a metal skewer. Just got to lift it a bit higher. Yes! 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 Getting here with the screwdriver now. I remember that I had to push this in to... It's almost like I've got to do maybe two things. I might have to push... Hello? I'm hoping that the tension of the cable is enough to push it in because the cable is all tied up the top there. See? It's almost fallen in off its own bat. It's almost like a... There we go. Hang on. Nah. All, all I've got to do, I think, is push that. I get two screwdrivers in there. And I think Bob's your uncle. Almost had it. Come on. Dazzler. No worries. All right, the moment of truth. Let's plug in a battery. Hope it's good. And let's see if we get anything back. Will it beep or not? Two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> you bloody ripper. Look at that. Beauty. Don't think I'll give up my day job though. And that actually went in like a treat. It's perfect with that uh, latching connector. And once it's in, it then slips over and the latch pulls back and Bob's your uncle. We're in. In like Flynn. Too easy. <laughs> and the good part about going in the bottom is, as I said, um, we really haven't damaged this thing. I could still resell this. No problems at all. And uh, we've just got an extra two bolt holes on the bottom. No big deal at all. Because these things are traditionally bolted down to the floor and this one's got holes on the back as well but yeah no big deal beauty it's like i bought one 
Okay, after that little fun detour, sorry about that, but hey, it was kind of fun. Very Hollywood style break into the safe. I love it. Beauty. Anyway, we've got a resistor in series with the battery here. Just chosen nominal value, 10 ohms. Uh, you want it to be high enough value so that you get sufficient uh, voltage drop across it based on the current pulses, any current pulses from the CPU so that you can actually see it on the scope. So you don't want, you know, microvolts, hundreds of microvolts. You want, you know, tens, hundreds of millivolts, something like that. But you don't want it to be too high so that the voltage uh, drops out. It's got to be able to operate the uh, solenoid too as well. So anyway, I've got a 10 ohm in there and I've got single shot capture on my scope. Let's press a button. Ta-da! Look at that! That's pretty good. That's 100 millivolts per division. So we've got like uh, 250 millivolts or thereabouts and we can actually go in there and look at the data packets. Look at that! I'm actually quite surprised. We're actually getting significant data detail on that. So we've got some sort of packet. We'll see how long it's lasting, but we're obviously getting some sort of regular oscillation there. Very interesting. We'll go look at the frequency and the detail of that. But really what I'm after for a power, power line analysis attack like this, if there is, as I said, any difference between when you press the correct button in sequence and an incorrect button, maybe the timing changes or some other data inside here changes. And of course, this is where you want a deep memory scope because you've got long packet like this and you want to go in and see all the details. So you want the deepest memory possible. So you go into the acquire menu and we're at 14 meg points at the moment. Heck, you know, we can go like the full 56 meg points of this sucker if we want. That's a phenomenal amount of data. And so we can single shot capture that again. And bingo, that's actually an incorrect one. Oops, I set the wrong time base there. So you set that and you don't want to waste all your memory. So you want to set it to, uh, well, you want to maximize the use of your memory. So you want as much a single data packet on there as possible. And you want to make sure it's one packet too. So you turn the time base down, I don't know, 200 milliseconds per division, reasonable. No, nah, it looks like we've only got the one packet there. So as I said, you want the maximum amount of that packet on the screen like that. And then bingo, you can capture that and get the absolute maximum detail based on the uh, sample memory of scope. Doing something like this, you, you know, you're going to want like a meg or two of memory at least. And just remember, when playing around with these locks, you can't just, you know, have unlimited attempts at this because these have lockout features to prevent uh, just people going in and try and hack the numbers. For example, if you uh, came along and tried to detect somebody's uh, fingerprint in there by dusting it or something like that, okay, you might get your six digits, but you don't know in what uh, order or combination they are, especially if they've used a number multiple times or something. And if you enter the incorrect uh, combination four times, you know, I think this lock is four times in a row, then it'll lock you out for five or ten minutes or something like that before you can actually try again. So that just limits just the uh, brute force code attack. Now, first thing we want to do is go in and see if there's any time difference in this packet uh, based on entering the correct number, first the correct number in sequence, and then an incorrect number in sequence. So it should be able to re-trigger it. So we're at 49.2 milliseconds here. So if we single cop shot capture that again, we enter the correct digit, number one, bingo, that's what we get. Now, if we go in there, single shot capture that again, and we enter, say, the number eight, nope. Looks like we're getting exactly the same time period. I mean, you could go in there and check for like a count the number of, uh, you know, pulses and things like that. But generally, um, that looks like it's exactly the same. Hmm. Scrub that one. Now, I'm actually curious to know the frequency of this signal that we're getting there because it looks like just repeating like that. So I suspect it might not be the processor. It could be that uh, buzzer that we're actually are hearing, that beep every time. Uh, you would have to actually know how long the beep goes for, and that could be the data packet. But the frequency could be the frequency of the beep. So we have to actually um, sample that audio and see what frequency that buzz is beeping at and compare it to this. In this case, it looks like, there we go, 4.072 kilohertz. So let's see if we can measure the uh, buzzer frequency. Now, I just downloaded one of these uh, little spectrum analyzer apps for my phone, Frequency. I don't know. It was the same. It was the one that, uh, the first one that pops up. And let's have a look. There we go. It is around about, you saw that, around about that four kilohertz mark. 
And here's another one called Specscope that will actually hold and freeze the display. So let's try that. So I think that's a bit too coincidental that this is so repetitive like this. It happens to be practically exactly the same frequency, just over 4 kilohertz mark. I think it's pretty safe bet to think that the maximum time period here will actually equal the amount of time that that uh, sound buzzes for. Let's round that to say 50 milliseconds or so for that packet. Well, let's actually do it a bit better than that. I can actually capture the audio with my Zoom H1 here and then load it into Audacity and then we can check it out that way. Much better, much more accurate. And here it is here in Audacity. I didn't get the amplitude right, but eh, it's going to be good enough. We can actually, uh, well, we can get the length of that, but let's actually go in and uh, have a good look at the spectrum. And what do we get? Here's our peak here. What is it? Ta-da! 4.077 we measured 4.075 bingo uh, my hunch was correct that this is just the uh, pwm signal driving the uh, piezo transducer in the things and i'm getting about 54 milliseconds there for that packet and well yeah because it's such low amplitude i'm not quite sure where to stop but yep it's near enough it's absolute certainty that this signal that we're seeing is just the piezo transducer. So because we've gotten that massive amplitude there, you know, a couple of hundred millivolts, well, we're not going to be able to see anything down on that. So that was uh, DC couple. What I'm going to do now is go into AC couple mode and uh, wind the wick down to 20 millivolts uh, per division. And so, you know, if we run that, like it's just going to sit there, right? like that so we're just getting like it's nothing right the micro's in sleep mode it's you know it's going to do absolutely nothing until it gets a button press and wakes up so i'm going to set my uh, trigger level you know just down below you know somewhere below that get it as close as you can so it's not triggering and then bingo like that so oh look we've got a couple of spikes in there not sure what's going on there but it's gone down and back up that's interesting. And bingo, there's our packet. Don't worry about this overshoot here. That's just because of the AC coupling. This is what I'm interested in here. So there's our packet that we saw before. That's the buzzer. But this could be the processor starting up, waking up, and doing something. So, uh-huh. Now we're getting somewhere. Hmm, so ignore all that. That's just our, the packet that we saw before. And because it's uh, 20 milliseconds per division, there it is, 20, 40. That's our 50 millisecond packet. Hmm, the processor's doing something in here. And that's what you'd expect. You expect the processor, when you push the key, you expect the processor to wake up, do some processing, figure it out if it's the correct uh, key or whatever, and then do the buzzer. And that's exactly what we're seeing. Set your time base back like that. Maybe, you know, set it back here or something, right to that point. So then we can start actually measuring that period there because maybe that time period will vary. So we should be able to re-trigger that one now and have a look. Let's try it again. Single shot. No, no, we've got another. No, that's just could be some other RF or garbage or something like that. So I'm not sure what the deal is there. There we go, that's better, that's better. And damn it, I've put myself in lockout mode, it just won't respond to any more beeps and it'll just flash that light every like 10 seconds or something, there we go. And damn, I gotta wait like five or 10 minutes. Brr. And as I've shown in a previous video, you've got to be careful with uh, stuff like this. You can pick up crap and all sorts of things. In this case, all this crap here is coming from my LED lights up there. So switch those off. Bingo, look at that. Now this is the data I captured here for the correct number. I've turned high res mode on just to get rid of some of that noise and crap. And we can see that we've got a nice little current draw there, then another little blip, maybe another little blip, and then we've got the packet which we've uh, seen before. So anyway, I could actually save this as a reference uh, waveform, for example, and then we can try and capture it again. So there we go, we can store that as a reference waveform and now we can capture it again and we can just see the difference visually on screen. Of course I can export this uh, data to a file and then I can go analyze it uh, on a PC or something like that if I really want.
So here we go, I've got my reference waveform there in white. Now let me press an incorrect button, say number eight. Oh, look at that. It looks pretty darn identical to me. Whoa, there's, there's nothing in that. It just comes down to noise. So there's no difference in the uh, pulse width there, that's that's got to be the process of starting up, doing something. We even get that little blip there, and we kind of even get that little blip there. So, yeah, hmm. So unless there's some more data out here, I'll check, but I don't believe there is. Um, we've pretty much uh, come a gutsa here, and, well, a null result, uh, which is kind of what I expected. I didn't expect to find a power line vulnerability uh, in this thing. Like, I actually didn't expect to get, well, anything out, anything useful out of this, but we've actually gotten and analyzed some useful data here, and, well, we just can't pick it. So they've obviously designed this thing uh, really well. Of course, you know, to get around all this sort of stuff, all they've got to do is design in decent decoupling into this thing and well you know you can't do any power line attacks if there's all that local you know a massive amount of local decoupling near the processor you just won't be able to see it from right back at the uh, battery terminals just a quick explanation on that in DaveCAD, if this is inside the safe as we'll see in a second it is like literally inside the safe it's not outside the uh, keypad so we only have access to the current out here now if this is the uh, cpu inside that's drawing little gulps of current when it powers up and and does that sort of stuff if you've got sufficient bulk decoupling inside the safe like this then it's going to get all those high frequency current uh, spikes from the decoupling, and then then the car and then the uh, capacitor is going to charge up at a much slower rate, like this, and it's all going to be hidden in. So, so all the detail is going to be hidden inside here, which you can't actually probe. It's not going to be hidden outside here when you actually measure the current going into the thing. So, yeah, if you if you try and design a safe like this and uh, one of these electronic locks, and you don't want it to be susceptible to power line attacks, well, you just filter the crap out of this line you know you could put in big lc filters and all sorts of you know massive amount of decoupling in there and that's they haven't actually done that by a huge amount because we were actually able to measure some things on there but hey i think they've taken things into account in the uh, software so a smart programmer would ensure that the lengths of the uh, software loops uh, regardless of whether or not you press a good or a bad button they will be exactly the same so that you can't do any power line analysis attack you know we could probably get in there and uh, you know like try and maybe get some minute differences and things but geez it yeah it's it's looking completely shot at this point point. and if i make that time base a bit slower you can see that there's just nothing out here so um that reference waveform stays the same period so there's our uh, our buzzer and that's the um ac coupling recovery but yeah we've got like yeah nothing and of course it goes without saying that the uh, main processor is in here and also the uh, flash e squared prom storage whatever it is for the uh, pin code is all inside this thing which is sealed inside the safe so when these things wear out in particular this one because it rotates like this it is not the world's most reliable uh design because well you know cables have to rotate and things like that so the ones with the levers on them are a much uh, much more reliable design than this one but hey this is only on a relatively cheap save so it's okay but yeah you might have to replace this thing the buttons wear out for example the wires inside well if the wires inside break you're screwed as i'll mention in a second but you can actually uh physically take this off and actually replace these uh things without um losing your uh, passcode so if those things break it, it doesn't matter you just replace the keypad on the front and the passcode is still stored in there so you can still get back into your safe no problems at all now if you can see right down in there, you can actually see the cable there, and if I rotate this, you can see that cable inside move, and you know, if you do this uh, too many times, then yeah, you cable you might eventually get a break in the cable so but i'm sure they've used you know top quality uh multi-strand cable in there so it's designed to be rotated like that but still you know it eventually could wear out if you open and shut this thing too many times so let's see if we can actually see anything useful inside here i hope it uh 
can come apart okay. Well, that came out no problems at all. And by the way, this is the older model, the 3740, the newer one's the 3750. It looks identical, but no surprises, this thing's over 10 years old. And is that version 1.00? Is that the firmware? Hmm, that's a worry. And we're in like Flynn. Check it out. There's the cable going off to the solenoid in there. And there's some decoupling action happening there. That's a decent amount of uh, tantalum, so that's all right. But uh, obviously wasn't enough for us to see some sort of uh, stuff. Surprise, surprise! I expected like a microchip pick in there perhaps, but no, we've got an ST Micro ST 62T uh, 25. And this is a one-time programmable OTP microcontroller. None of this modern flash rubbish. Heck, it's not even E squared prom. It is, um, yeah, an OTP uh, micro, very, you know, I like discontinued these days, they don't use these anymore. So there's no internal uh, E squared prom in that to actually store the code. So ta da, that's why. You can just see it in 93C64. So they get an, once again, that's ST. So they've got an external uh, 1K serial E squared prom. And that's what stores your pin code in there. But this is. Yeah, very old school, but considering that this design no doubt dates back to Lagarde's, you know, very early design, maybe like back in like 1990 or very early 90s, then yeah, I guess it's not that uh, surprising. And the legacy uh, micro still continued over. Hey, they got the code, it's all being verified and proven, so, you know, you don't want to go messing with it when you've got a winning product, a market-leading product like that. And there's nothing too exciting happening. External uh, 4 megahertz uh, crystal here. We've got uh, the decoupling, as I said. We're going to have some regulation. We've got a PMP drive transistor up here for our uh, solenoid. No problems whatsoever. And yeah, that's a bit... Uh, looks like we've got a big-ass diode protection. Little uh, poly switch in there. And Bob's your uncle. Now, if we have a look to see how this thing works from the inside... Sorry, I haven't screwed it back in. But you can see that the only thing stopping pulling that back is that little plate which drops down there which actually has a taper on it like that and well let's punch in the right code and see what we get and bingo it allows that to go through in there so there's something in there that actually releases that pin and then once it goes back of course Boom, it just drops back into place and locks like that. Nothing you can do. And there's the back of the main board. Actually got lots of uh, test pads on here, all numbered. So obviously some sort of uh, decent amount of uh, bed of nails production test in there. And if we take this all apart, if we get our solenoid out there, here we go. We can have a look at the, here's our little... Uh, plate that has this spring on it so it keeps it sprung down in there that's what keeps it sprung to solenoid and that just uh, sits in there so let me see if I can uh, power this thing up with this backing plate off and you can have a look in there and if you want to have a look this just uh, there this is the rotating plate in the bottom there which then just when you rotate it it just pulls this thing back now we've just got this little metal rod in there and obviously when the solenoid kicks in it's going to suck that all the way in there and then of course this thing is free to move up and this whole thing push back too easy so if we try that again oh you can see that i hopefully you saw that bump <laughs> it fell out oops <laughs> gravity's a bitch Wow, for a minute there, I thought I found a massive vulnerability in this thing. Like, if you hold it up like that, no problems at all. But if you hold it up like that, boom, it come, it opens. And I thought, what the hell? Surely if you just tip the safe on its side, there is, you know, no way that, that vulnerability would have been found. It's because the pin was able to slip via gravity all the way back in to the solenoid without having it actually on. Wow! But, no, as it turns out, no, there's nothing wrong with it at all because look what I found. I realised that they must have something else in the shaft. 
Wah! I found a little spring on the floor which must have fell out and that's what keeps the pin uh, pushed out um, of that thing. So maybe technically, you know, some bump vulnerability there, but the pin, there's not enough mass in that pin though. It's all to do with the mass of the pin in that solenoid and the spring behind it, which normally keeps it out. Oops, I gotta disassemble it and reassemble it with the right part. Hmm. So maybe you can see what I mean by bumping. I've put the spring in there now, which keeps it out, and that's fine and dandy, but if you boom, you know, if you bump the safe like that, boom, the spring could technically go back into there, but it has to go all the way back in, and you've got to turn it at the right time, so I'm sure Lagarde have done their homework on that anyway, like, uh, yeah, trying to bump a 40 kilo safe like this, hmm. No, that seems pretty good, I can't can't do anything to that at all, can't get it to release, so no, you can't bump these locks. And what about a drilling attack, uh, like through the front for example, to try and, uh, you know, get that solenoid pin to operate and stuff like that? Well, I think good luck with that, I mean, maybe, in theory, but geez, I don't, in, in practice it'd just, yeah, I, like you're better off just, uh, you know, cutting into it. Uh, uh, some other way, I think. So yeah, that wouldn't be uh, terribly easy. So these things aren't particular. I don't think these are particularly easy to defeat in this particular scenario. I mean, you know, there's no way you can uh, sort of crack in there from outside and get access to the E squared uh, prom and read the code out. You can't do power line analysis attack. You can't bump the things. So they're they're pretty darn secure electronic locks. No wonder this is like, you know, the industry leading almost um, de facto standard electronic lock on even, you know, quite decent medium uh, to high range safes. So there you go. I hope you liked that video. Even though we didn't successfully defeat this electronic lock, we did actually, well, kind of, sort of crack into it Hollywood uh, style via the drilling and the camera and all sorts of the things. I thought it was a great fun and it's an interesting engineering exercise to see how these things are designed and built to be secure. And well, even though we didn't find the uh, uh, vulnerability in these things, it's uh, that's actually good to know and well we don't want any uh, um, you know publication bias here so it's always good to publish even negative results like this because it actually even though it's negative it proves that these things are, are pretty darn secure I like it but one of the issues is even if we were successful in our power line attack here and we could figure out uh, what the combination was well what the numbers are and that's the key point you can only figure out what digits are actually used in the combination, but you still got a six digit combination. So when you have the uh, lockout feature of these electronic locks, four unsuccessful attempts locks you out for five minutes, well, how the hell are you gonna do it in any reasonable amount of time? You can't, you're gonna be screwed. So if you're a thief getting in there, even if you had a little automated jig to, uh, you know, micro to plug up to it and it, go, it told you what six digits there, you don't have hours to sit there and try and hopefully guess the combination. It's, you know, you wanna be bam, in and out. So yeah, these things are still secure, even if we were able to do something here. So I hope you enjoyed that. If you want to discuss it, jump on over to the eevblog.com. I'll probably have some high-res uh, photos of the uh, lock and inside uh, the thing up on eevblog.com as well. There'll be a link to the forum down below and follow me on Twitter and, you know, all that sort of jazz and subscribe and, you know, give it a thumbs up if you like it the other way. Catch you next time.